Hola, bon dia, benvinguts. Uh, welcome to this keynote lecture uh, under the subject Creating New Audiences for Art Institutions. We have the enormous pleasure to have among us Ron Magliotti. He is Associate Curator in the Department of Film at the Museum of uh, Modern Art in New York. Uh, he studied film in, in Colombia. And at a time the, where you studied film, you could either become a filmmaker or be a professor of film. But uh, soon, luckily, Ron discovered that he was not interested in those things, but in a, in a third way, uh, becoming an archivist. And he went to, to, he went to MoMA uh, Museum, uh, started as an intern, and then made his way uh, as a programmer, as a curator. And um, so, uh, uh, so in the end, uh, this is his, uh, his present job since uh, 1993. He's curated over 50 film series and gallery exhibitions including three outstanding exhibitions on animation art uh, that are the Pixar Studio exhibition, the Tim Burton exhibition, which is still touring around the world, and the Quay Brothers exhibition, that the last one is the one that, that brought us uh, together. Uh, and um, uh, he's also curated the work of uh, artists Dante Ferretti and Stan Brackett, among many, many others. Uh, he's active in the International Federation of Film Archives and responsible for restoring the work of some uh, filmmakers as the animators, uh, John and Faith Hablin. And at the present, he is working on the restoration of the early Quay Brothers uh, films, among many other very interesting uh, projects. Uh, we are particularly uh, happy and proud that a uh, representative from MoMA is uh, here with us this morning. Uh, because MoMA is, it was the first institution, the first museum on incorporating cinema as an artistic discipline uh, of the 20th century as early as 1934. So in that respect, they were the first ones uh, to, create, uh, to create an audience for, for cinema. They were aware about how important it was to collect, to preserve, but also to screen and exhibit. Uh, and, and so they were pioneers on building up uh, a new and serious consideration on a, at the time, popular art form. And not only projecting uh, films like intellectual or art films, but also popular films. So mixing, for instance, Einstein's name with Chaplin. Uh, it was visionary, uh, I think, from that museum. Um, uh, to understand cinema not, not as a matter of confronta confrontating popular cinema against intellectual or experimental cinema, but provide the space for a cultural approach towards all genres and forms of cinema. For that, the role of MoMA on creating a cultivated audience was vital then as it still is now. Thank you for coming, Ron, and, and sharing, I'm sure, your interesting career and approach. Thank you. In MoMA over the years. Thank you to Lou and to Conrado and Adeline and particularly to um, Carolina, who's brilliant, really. If you haven't seen the Metamorphosis exhibition, you're missing perhaps the best exhibition on cinema anywhere in the world at the moment. I haven't seen all the other exhibitions, so I can't, you know, I can't speak for Languar at Cinematheque Francaise, which I'm sure was also amazing. Um, I'd like to begin with some very old media. I believe the historical record of pre-cinema and early cinema indicate that the moving image has always desired to be free. We might say it's in the nature of a medium steadily evolving in terms of format and flexibility. Old media moving image began as a roaming phenomenon, as you can see here. The audience for moving images has always yearned for hands-on access. Uh, by the early 1900s, we find antecedents for many of the exhibition practices later associated with expanded cinema and new media. Uh, particularly this precedent for large-scale projection from 1910, 1912. It's an advertisement about a company that would do large-scale projections anywhere in the city of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, all media was handheld. 
Uh, around 1906 and 1908, there are many proto-selfies like this one uh, with handheld moving image devices. An alternative, an, alternative, an alternative site for moving image exhibition circa 1908. This is outside the black box of traditional cinemas heralded with banners. Here, the auditorium, Air Dome Beautiful in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1909. There were thousands of these outdoor cinemas across the United States, and I assume across Europe as well, through the 1920s. These are a precursor, of course, to the drive-in cinemas that later served the automobile culture in America. In the evening, the night sky and the stars become the black box for the moving image, again heralded by banners, pennants, and flags. Storefront cinemas, which what we call, were called Nickelodeons, were small, family-run businesses spawned by the relatively easy access to equipment and films. Anyone could buy films, you purchased them, and you used them until they wore out, and you could open a storefront cinema such as this. 1900 to 1914, comparable to hap, perhaps to this. Today, we skip from public, the public interface of old media in 1908 to the public interface of new media in 2014. Again, this is storefront businesses. New media is much more of the same, on-demand access to content anytime, anywhere, on any digital device, as well as interactive user feedback, creative participation with the real-time generation of new and unregulated content. Um, commenting on the proliferation of moving image, the director Robert Altman observed shortly before his death in 2006, we live in a world where everything has become an image. Again, banners. Um, and I begin this ancient history because I want you to be aware of how heavily early cinema determines my point of view um, and judgment as a curator. And for now, let's get off the street and... That's only half the slide. It actually says, artist, curator, institution, and audience. Uh, a subject is moving image and arts organizations, and I want you to know what I think about the artist, the curator, the institution, and the audience. The institution is a building with differing, differing kinds of architecture. The character of an institution is shaped by it being governmental or private, an art museum or a museum of the moving image. The nature of, an, of the exhibition, its mounts, it mounts are significantly determined by its architecture, its galleries, their size, their height, and their adjacencies. Its arrangement of white cubes and black boxes and of its public spaces. Institutions have financial structures, they have budgets, they have policies, and they have bureaucracies. If you're a curator, you know all, of all about this. The artist. The artist is everything. Producer of art, maker of art history. An artist is living or dead. An artist has demands, he has legacies, he has caretakers, dealers, and distributors. Artists can be curators. Curators. Curators are more or less scholars, administrators, hustlers, politicians, they come from differing disciplines with different areas of expertise and different skill sets. The best curatorship, in my opinion, combines scholarship, taste, personal vision, and a sense of showmanship, which some curators don't have. A curator's role is to sustain inter exposure and encourage interest in the work selected for exhibition. Curators can be artists. The audience. The audience is the general public, who may be interested or disinterested, interactive or not. Uh, members or non-members. Um, it is professionals, scholars and critics, the press, other artists, supporters, trustees, and members. An audience can be global, but despite globalization, I think that audiences have characteristics that differ from country to country and from city to city. I was speaking to someone recently who said, people in New York don't spend time looking at moving image. People, people in New York want to say they've been to every exhibition in town, they run from every show, they see bits of it. I think this was a German who was saying it in, in our country, maybe it was from, someone from Rotterdam, actually it was the, Rotterdam, said in Rotterdam there's less to see, so people, the visitors spend a longer time in, 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 the, in the gallery. Um, so 
I propose we consider the museum art of modern art as a case study, a paradigm of how art institutions have treated the moving image over the past 80 years. However, I did not intend this to be a hagiography or to give the impression that I am chauvinistic about MoMA in New York. MoMA has not always been the most forward-looking or adventurous arts institution when it comes to the moving image. I could say that the Whitney Museum in New York, the New Museum in New York, for instance, uh, the Tate Modern in London, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, Centre for Contemporary Culture in Barcelona, have, on a, to name only a few, on occasion been uh, more ambitious. So in 1935, the founding director of MoMA wrote, which you see on screen, modern art is not confined to painting and sculpture. The trustees and directors of the Museum of Modern Art have planned since the foundation of the institution in 1928 to develop a department of motion pictures. The art of the motion picture is the only great art peculiar to the 20th century. And this document from a few years earlier in June 1932, and I'm going to read this, is it's, so, it's funny. Presentation of important films. The film department of the museum, this is before the department was founded, would attempt to show films which have not been seen publicly. Commercial films of quality which have been lost in the welter of commercial mediocrity, amateur and avant-garde films by men such as Man Ray, uh, Rodovich, the Comte de Beaumont, Ferlin Leger, Maholi Nage, Rutman, Ralph Steiner, Cora Rubias, and Bunuel, and films of the past 30 years which are worth reviving either because of their quality or because of their importance to the development of the art. The audience could be divided into three classes. We were speaking about audiences and users this morning. This is interesting. One, a professional audience who produces directors, amateur producers, critics, and other experts. Two, a selected audience of influential and important art patrons who might, by their influence, make possible a real appreciation of good films in this country. And three, a more general audience made up, perhaps, of members of the, muse of, of, of the museum. We should remember that these documents address the world of the 1930s. There is much to praise from that perspective, there are also principles of selectivity, elitism, even sexism. There are no women mentioned in the list of artists that would be presented that seem perhaps out of date to us in 2014. And we mustn't forget that in Paris, London, and, and Berlin at the same time, archives were being established. So let's look at an average day at the museum in this graphic depiction from 1940. When I mentioned art, the architecture in, of a building, of an institution earlier, this is what I had in mind. This, this, this structure itself suggests hierarchy, class distinction, and linear narratives. Perhaps it reminds you, it reminds you of a, the cross-section of a transatlantic ocean liner, the Titanic, <laughs> with the, uh, the different classes. Um, you can see where cinema is. Cinema is the yellow at the bottom. Uh, or a prison, perhaps, or a library, library space. <coughs> This exhibition space is a pile of white cubes and black boxes. When I started at the museum in 1979, this is the museum that I came into. It's exactly the same building that I entered. Uh, the linear narrative continues here with these shelves of the film's circulating film distribution office in the 1950s. This is an image from the 1950s. The museum immediately began an arc building an archive and circulating films on film. Of course, there's a free video. The distribution of films to schools, universities, groups, and arts organizations began at the museum in the mid-30s. Another manifestation of its utopian model for the, of the moving image, that there should be exhibition, education, preservation, and distribution. This is the model that arts, art institutions have sought to replicate to the present day, of course. Uh, and now I'd like to begin a um, review of, of moving images. Most of what I'm going to do is just show you what the moving image looked like in MoMO through a series of installation shots. Um, beginning in 1939. The first moving image gallery was the museum's Titus I Theater in this heroic image. Notice Renaissance perspective. This elegant Bauhaus design of the period has been designated an official New York landmark. This is a preserved interior. Uh, and this auditorium is the oldest continuously running cinema in the city of New York now, opened in 1939. And it wasn't, I didn't come up with that. Someone came to me one day and said, you are the oldest running theater cinema in New York, disprove me. <laughs> and the staff tried to figure if we could find another cinema in New York that had been running continuously, I mean, of course, and we couldn't. Here's the museum's 1940s audience 
This was a publicity shot the museum released. In the cocoon of the cinema, as Roland Barthes has described it, this is the subterranean black box from which moving image artists of the 1960s sought to escape after 50 years of traditional presentation. This is an image of institutionalized commercial Hollywood. This is uh, Greta Garbo and Anna Christie cinema. Um, scholars are calling this industrial cinema, Hollywood cinema now, as a way of distributing it from artist cinema or artist video. With the art and the moving image audience positioned frontally as they were almost exclusively from the 20s to the 60s. This is the Titus uh, One Lobby in 1939, right outside the auditorium you just saw. Um, outside the black box of the cinema is a white box, the white cube, as this described. You probably know that term. It's widely used to describe museum gallery space. Uh, the museum has done over 80 cinema-related exhibitions in this space, small-scale things, posters and such, since 1939. So there's a long history of exhibiting on cinema in a gallery, but not with moving image. It was all with, with flat art. Um, note the effort, this is 1930, to represent the moving image on the walls of the installation here. They've actually, these are photographs from abstract films, which they've mounted like a strip of film around the walls. I find it very interesting, and actually I recreated I, a year ago, I recreated this lobby as a model to the institution. I, did, I brought in cactuses. I put up a mirror. There used to be mirrors at the end. I've added mirrors to the space to recreate what it looked like in 1930. I don't know if people appreciated it. I thought it was great. <laughs> when you're a curator and you own the space, I could do it. Also, it was very low budget. It was a collection show. So it, I have to curate the space on a budget. So sometimes I do loan shows and then I'll do a, a, a collection show. Um, as you know, the history of the moving image is a history of evolving formats. Although the Titus Theater and the Titus Lobby I just showed you have been fixtures in the presentation of the moving image at MoMA, this department of the moving image has redefined itself a number of times, as you see here. It is evolving formats. Did I go one too far? There it is. Um, that come to determine how the moving image went from the gallery, from the cinema to the, uh, to the gallery. Uh, I know they showed moving image in the moment, Sculpture Gardens, but this is the only image I could find before 1968 that had anything like moving image in it. This is from a 1955 exhibition on UPA called Form and the Animated Cartoon, and there were stroboscopic boxes that you could see that were lighted, so there was some form of moving image in the space. Um, the first exhibition So now we come to video. Nam June Pike, Korean artist, Wolf Vostel, German painter and sculptor, Andy Warhol are among those credited with being the first artist to work with video. In 1965, you probably all know this, the portable video camera, the Portapack, was a battery-powered, self-contained videotape analog recording system. In 1968, video was videotape, a camera, a recording deck, a monitor, and image processing equipment. This is an image from the landmark MoMA exhibition titled Machine as Seen at the End of the Mechanical Age. So in 1968, the museum had already identified the mechanical age had ended. Basically, they're telling us cinema has ended, video was here. Um, there wasn't much video in it. There were a few video works. Uh, what you see here, because um, it's an analog video, there's two monitors on the floor in that box. It appears also to be the first time that the painting and sculpture department curated an exhibition that included moving image. This was not a cinema department exhibition, it was the painting and sculpture exhibition. Because I'm, you know, MoMA is an, arts, an art museum, so uh, that plays a big part in, in the way the moving image archivists think about it. In this case, what you're looking at is Nam June Pike work. Three works were exhibited, Nixon tapes, Lindsay tape, and McLuhan on a cage. So the video presented here, which is single channel video, was political in nature too. I find that very interesting. Two years later, the Howard Wise Gallery in New York did a show called TV as Creative Medium. It was the first U.S. exhibition devoted exclusively to video art. This is another image from the machine in, in, in the mechanical age. Uh, Nam June Pike installation in 1977. Video monitor, video projection, three single channel works. This form of moving installation set up screen, 
Frontal viewing is standard to this day with variations, of course, carpeting, you put cushions on the floor. Um, or I was at LACMA when they did the Christa Marclay's The Clock, they put huge comfortable <coughs> sofas because people, of course, were going to sit there 24 hours. And um, Carolina has sofas in her eccentric things, but the ones at LACMA were huge. <laughs> and, um, this is a kind of mini cinema which you find tucked into white cube gallery exhibitions today all over the world. I went to the Tate Modern not long ago, there was viewing spaces like this. The seating is gallery seating, you notice, it's not theater seating. Um, you're not intended to sleep in his space. It's telling you you can't sleep. The couches at LACMA said you could sleep. This is telling you, <laughs> no, we don't want you to sleep. Um, this is not a cocoon. From 1971, 1978, museum established a video product, project series where they began showing video works in the gallery. Uh, they founded a video collection at the museum, just like the film collection, to collect, exhibit, preserve, and circulate video. So the museum's been collecting video since 19, I think it's 75, um, and began video viewpoints. That was a monthly conversation with the artist, where the artist came in and um, spoke to an audience. Now it's called, we call it um, Modern Mondays, and it's cinema, digital artists, all kinds of artists still come in every Monday and have a conversation. Um, in 1983, uh, the museum published its circulating video catalog. You saw the fellow with all the films on the shelves. We began distributing videos. The first catalog had represented 42 artists, including, of course, Nam June Pike, uh, Linda Benglis, Ed M. Schwiller, and approximately 300 works were distributed. Three-quarter-inch video in the 1970s made exhibition and distribution feasible everywhere, and video became useful for social and political commentary, personal reflection, and conceptual expression, the same way it's being used today. And video art was sold in unlimited editions at modest prices to universities, libraries, and museums. The whole idea of editioning things, which has come up now, is distressing, particularly people who, come, who have a long history of not having to deal with editioned work. Um, Video became a globalized phenomenon in the 1970s. So this is not it's relatively old, this history, with festivals and art fairs in Los Angeles, Tokyo, Locarno, and Sao Paulo, and elsewhere. Um, by the mid-1990s, analog video had a mature history and a significant body of work to its credit. Landmark retrospective exhibitions were held at MoMA and at the Whitney. Chrissy Isles did one at the Whitney in 2000. This one was at MoMA in 1995. This was called um, Video Space, Eight Installations. What you're looking at is Bill Viola's Turning Narrative. <clears throat> Two-channel two video installation, two projectors and a rotating wall. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, artists used films and slides, video, photographic projections, and hol holography to measure, abstract, document, reflect, and transform physical space. Video artists worked in a hybrid of the white cube and the black box. As you all know, that's still done today. You can see that throughout the space, even here today. The darkened space of the cinema versus the white cube of the gallery. Cinema being a hypnotic space, gallery space being a space of wakeful a sense of perception. That's the notion that the artists and curators would presumably use when they install works in different places. Um, this is from video space, eight channel video installation with 18, 19 monitors. This is what a video, this is what a retrospective exhibition of video looked like in 1995. Most of the artists of this period also worked in other mediums as today. Sculpture, photography, earthworks, neon, film, drawing, sound, performance, which inform the texture, the form, and the sense of time that their moving image works, the, gallery, the moving image works they created for the galleries. Um, Tension is on the space itself, on the beam of projection, on the sculptural nature, on the interlocking locking vid multiple videos. This is Stan Douglas' evening. Three channel installation, three projectors, a critique of news media. These are familiar forms. I see them, I saw them all around town this week, the same kind of forms. Um, Chris Marker, 1994 silent movie. Five channel installation, five stack, 25 inch video monitors with computer controlled, controlled images. This is an image from a Smithsonian uh, installation in Washington, D.C. By the mid-90s, video as an art form was single channel on monitors or projected, video sculpture, such as this one. This is more environmental as well as sculptural. 
and environmental installations, often with dance and performance. Um, this one of Namjoon Pike's whimsical sculptural installations, which are especially suited, as someone else has observed, to museums of contemporary art, because they're of a scale that fits in with their sculpture. They fit in with the other kind of art that you put in a gallery. This is a 2004 version of, you may know this, late Dieter Roth's garden sculpture, which he began in the 70s as an ever-evolving, growing work, adding recycled and decaying elements as forensic, as um, futuristic forensics, and continues to grow under the care of his son and, and, and assistants. This is Gary Hills in as much as it is already, always already taking place. 16 channel, 16 black and white TV tubes and wires. Another old sculptural piece. To me, this is the most, this is probably my favorite video piece of all time to date. Uh, I think it's iconic and incredibly beautiful. Um, and to me, one of the most technologically sensuous works in the canon of analog video. Um, if I wanted to relate physically to any work of video, this would be the one. I just want to climb in there and get in there with the tubes and the screens. Um, all the work I'm showing is in the museum's collection. Most often when we do exhibitions, we try to acquire work that's being exhibited. It's part of the nature of how the museum structured its collection, the way it built its collection. Um, this is Tony Osler's System for Dramatic Feedback. 1994, a 10-channel video, nine monitors animating rag dolls on a large screen, a single large video projection, sculptural and multimedia. Uh, here is a fully artist-curated installation from 2006. The artist is an arch architectural firm, Herzog and Demuron in New York. This was a MoMA artist choice show, meaning as other institutions do, where the firm came and looked at the museums, in this case, the museum's film collection, uh, and curated this collection. Um, they asked us, and the film curators had to clear the rights for feature films by Scorsese and others, which were then mounted on ceiling panels, and visitors were given handheld mirrors to view the images on the screen. <laughs> uh, the, some of curators in the department thought that filmmakers are going to be outraged, they're not going to like this at all, and the complete opposite was the case. Of course, the filmmakers were eager to have their work in a gallery, and Scorsese for, for one. I've never found a filmmaker who wasn't, I've never said any filmmaker say no to these kind of initiatives. Um, that was an artist curated. Here is a curator curated work in 2004. As a film curator, I was given the mandate to bring the cinema out of the black box into the public <laughs> space in museum, above ground in museum galleries. We've done things downstairs. This was to bring it upstairs with the other curatorial departments. This was a big issue for me, and I was very intimidated by this, um, because um, of the nature of museum politics and access to the space. This is a wireframe, this is this was the Pixar exhibition, 2005, the first big exhibition that I did, which actually Steve Jobs brought to the museum, said he was backing, would you be interested in doing an exhibition? our work to Glenn Lowry. Lowry came to the head of the film department. The head of the film department came to me because I had worked in installation work and I had done, um, and I was, animation is one of my favorite things. So I, I um, this is another piece, a uh, digital piece. These are actually irises. I went to the Pixar studio and these are all collection shows where I sat, I went to the archive and looked at all the animation art. You'll see a lot more of this later. I also sat with the, this was a, you know, the digital films. This was a digital exhibition. Um, I said I was an analog person, but I love digital. I couldn't do the exhibitions I did without digital. I sat with the digital artists at Pixar, and these were irises for the bugs in the bug's life, the feature <laughs> film, and I look at thousands of irises, and with the artists, we developed the artists, the Pixar artists, because they were artists. This was a studio show but we considered the studio as the artist. I created the installation piece, which I created because it would relate to the other kinds of art that the painting and other departments were exhibiting in the museum. Um, in a sense, I, was, I felt kind of constricted. It was very calculated on my part. And there's another installation. This was in the media gallery. The children's pieces were silent. This piece had sound. It was created, by, again, with the, uh, with the Pixar curators. What we did took some of the background art that was on paper and I curated the selection. The artists did this large video piece. Um, uh, 
this is an, cause an expanded black box. Uh, there's a theme park quality to this installation, which the security guard in the gallery picked up on, and of his own volition began becoming a carnival barker. He was directed, the, direct your attention here, it was very amusing. I was very pleased with that. Um, a more recent artist curator collaboration is, this is the Quay Brothers exhibition, um, where the Quays came to the museum, looked at this white cube that we had, and we developed a maze-like configuration of the gallery space, which grew from discussions about how I wanted to narrate the filmmakers up to that time intentionally obscure by personal history. The Quays lied about their history, said things were lost, and pretended they were Europeans when actually they came from Philadelphia, not far <laughs> from New York. So we decided that we would kind of make uh, this uh, labyrinth, which I'm delighted to say Carolina has a bit of in the installation here. Uh, and this was the artist, the Quays curated this, the opening, this entry into the exhibition. Um, Digital installation technology has allowed artists and institutions to explore the spectacular aspects of the moving image. We were Sherry talking about that the other day. Destination, destination installations such as Doug Aitken's Sleepwalker at MoMA in 2007 complement the destination architecture of contemporary arts organizations. The Tate Modern has, has its turbine hall. I Institute in Amsterdam, as you know, has a new building about to take flight off the canal in Amsterdam. The Getty in Los Angeles has a mountaintop campus. These are all destination architecture. The um, MoMA doesn't have so much destination architecture. The Guggenheim is destination architecture. Uh, but large scale narrative works like this are far outside the black box. It's a new media writ large. Um, I have to say that I was somewhat troubled by this installation because the, it was done by the media curator. This is pre Stuart Cummer. And, the media curator has in no way acknowledged that this, is the, that this has been done in, in cinema history beforehand. Somehow, it wasn't acknowledged. And we were a bit troubled by that. Um, Pippalotti Wrists, Pour Your Body Out um, in 2008. The fundamentals of expanded media and the experience of moving image like this include intermix, participation with the audience, destruction and abstraction of the moving image projection, decoding and manipulation of commercial cinema. This is a cinema piece. Um, breaks from two-dimensionality of traditional film exhibition. Another example, a single-channel video installation calls for a particular kind of engagement from visitors. We see this a lot in, in, in museums. This is Steve Paxton's The Weight of Sensation. This is in the same space that the Pippalotti Wrist piece was in. Steve uh, Paxton is, a, is a, a dancer who works with the architecture of the body, and he performed in the space, uh, as well as this projection. Um, Another shot of the, of the view. Isaac Julian's 10,000 Waves in 2013 at MoMA. This is again in the same installation space the Pippalotti Wrist and the Steve Wright was. This is a Brechtian screen screen moment um, from a spectacular narrative, floating cinema. To me, this calls to mind the air domes that we saw outside in, in a way, even though it's in a kind of grand white dome. It also calls to mind what filmmaker Jacques Rivette said in the mid-70s. He said, quote, the cinema I'm after, and he, remember Rivette was a filmmaker, are films which impose themselves on the spectator through a sort of domination of visual and sound events and which require a screen, a big screen, to be effective. These are films that impose themselves visually through their monumentality. What I mean is that there is a weight to what is on the screen, as a statue might be, or a building, or a giant beast. End quote. This is a 360 degree New York City centric panorama. This is from the Whitney Museum in 2013, Chrissy Isles curated exhibition, which recalls, if you know, 19th century cycloramas. Um, visitors are often an immersive experience. These spectacular often have a going for an immersive experience. Um, the video performance artist Joan Jonas described gallery. Visitors and galleries as completing the work, the artwork. This is uh, an audience pleasing installation. Um, and it should be noted, these kind of installations, all these large installations have critics. And the critics, Alexander Horvath at the Austrian film curator, recently questioned the effect of these in installations that too closely resemble the experience of shopping malls. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the things that our institutions are adapted by commercial outfits, when that happens, 
To me, a curate has to respond to that <laughs> in some way. I mean, it has to create, do an installation that, that I want to divorce myself from that in some way. Um, there are those who may want to embrace it. Um, uh, conceived in 1971, this is Paul McCarthy's spinning room. Again, at the, at the, at the Whitney. Uh, he conceived it in 71, but couldn't realize it until digital technology allowed him. Again, an immersive moving image experience that the artist intended to resemble an amusement park ride or a theme park attraction, welcoming comparison to pop culture. This is the issue for me as a curator of film. If I bring Tim Burton to Pixar, then I'm bringing the most vulgar of commercial cinema into an installation space. I love that challenge. Um, and it's something that I intended, intended to do with, with the Tim Burton show. In another way, we played with the same kind of pop elements um, again, creating an entry into the exhibition. The cue for this kind of entry, which definitely references theme parks and si circus sideshows, comes, of course, from the carnival as aspects of Tim's own work. Um, it's also a response to the space that I was given for the exhibition. It had this long, thin hall with windows. The left side of the screen is actually windows, which I had blocked off. I, in discussions with Tim, that monster mouth you saw over the thing was, was from his art. Um, space wasn't large enough. Again, I was being immersive in a different way than the kind of large scale immersive. I had this long hall which ended in a black light box. There's a black light sculpture that Tim created at the end of the hall. Um, and it was, I intentionally wanted to disorient the audience. I have this thing as a curator of wanting the audiences to be disoriented when I installed video. Um, <laughs> This was, became a crowded space. Uh, sound was an issue. There was a, all these six months had sound on them. The work I was showing was not work people knew. I wanted people to come to the Tim Burton exhibition expecting to see Batman and seeing something that they didn't expect to see. Uh, and it was somewhat successful. The, there was a lot of sound bleed on these monitors. I, I, I embraced that. I was looking for that um, under the form of disorientation. Uh, these were six Blu-ray screens showing it was a web series that Tim had done that no one looked at, and the copies online were horrible. So I was able to show it in the museum in a way it had never been shown as an online internet thing, because the internet access was dreadful compared to what you could do in a, in a gallery. And the quality of the image in a gallery is very important. I'll talk a bit about, about that later. Uh, similarly, an immersive exhibition that I did last year uh, was a collaboration with the artist Dante Ferretti, Designing construction for the cinema, it was called. Ferretti's the designer for Pasolini and Fellini and all the Scorsese films. Um, again, um, was to create a moving into environment. I gave Dante the space. Dante did this. He was a designer. He gave me this, the kind of presentation you would make to an art film artist. He, this was the way he conceived the space. This was the same type of space with the cactus that I showed you earlier. So it's got a very low ceiling. Um, Again, disorientation. Um, the hardest part of this exhibition was not the video technology. Um, new video technology allowed us, we have an amazing AV staff. They said, I don't like these projectors. We, they had projectors, they were brand new. They gave it such a steep projection onto the screen that visitors could get right up to the screen. There was no, very, no interference with it. You had to get very, very close to the screen before you cast a reflection on it. Remark, also the screen material. Uh, we tested all kinds of screen material. You could, this, you could see the same image from both sides. Um, remarkable technology. And it was based on an exhibition installation that Dante had done for Fellini in Rome in 2010, where he had done uh, Fellini excerpts on screens. Very different material, very different effect. But um, the hardest part of this exhibition was not the technology. It was going to 46 film studios, the feature films, and asking to clear the rights to these clips. Um, the budget was $40,000 for the clips the first time, and we had to go back to them over a year and say, we're an educational institution, lower the price. Uh, and eventually we got it down. I think it cost $15,000 from $40,000. They came back with us at the end and said, you now must clip, get, clear the rights of every actor who appears on screen. We need them to sign an agreement to that. That was absurd. Uh, we had to go to Anthony Hopkins. Um, we did, we did, even as a fair use, if you make the effort to find the artist, we send things to the lawyers and they don't respond, we put it on screen anyway. No one came back to us and, and, and complained. Um, Johnny Depp, you, can, you can't reach Johnny Depp. I know Tim Burton, even with that help, I couldn't reach Johnny Depp. Um, 
At this point, I want to digress just quickly for another bit of old media in moving image history. In contemporary art practice, practically all large-scale immersive moving image installations owe something to artist Stan Vanderbeek, who you see here is his movie dome that he constructed in New York State in 1963 to 1966. This is the interior view of, look, this is a shot from 1966. Uh, 31 foot high, a spinning, he had a spinning table in the middle of the room with a card of 60 millimeter projectors, slide projectors, computers, and fax machines. In the period, 1960s, this was expanded cinema at its most spectacular. Uh, the moving images split, overlapped, multiplied, serialized, and mirrored. Van de Beek, like pioneers like Nam June Pike and Chris Marker in particular, are artists whose work was seen at the time as humanizing technology. I mean, these are artists who took technology and gave it a human dimension uh, through the sculptural effects they made and such. Um, this is a 2011 restaging of Van der Beek's movie dome at the New Museum in New York, where they mounted it. I looked at this, I said, I should have done this. They did it, as I said, more ambitious. Um, the beam of projection, the visitors are intended to interact with the technology of projection. There were purists in, who criticized this, they said, you're projecting this, this is, these are all video, digital projections. Since you're not using film projectors, this is not an accurate recreation. Um, but the exhibition offered what they call the prehistory of the digital age. That's what this was intended to do, even though they used digital technology to, to tell this prehistory. Um, in 2011, um, actually the new museum was 2012, 2011, again Stan Vanderbeek uh, in MIT in Boston, they restaged Van De Stan Vanderbeek's movie mural, which he called in the, a portable version of the movie dome. He couldn't do the movie dome, it couldn't travel around, it was too expensive, so he did this portable version of it, which was a series of, as you can see, screens where he had projectors on loops. Again, at MIT, they used digital projections. Um, and I want to return to a brief survey of MoMA exhibitions by departments. There were 13 curators of film and media and performance at the Museum of Modern Art. And you would be correct in assuming that those are the 13 curators who put moving image into galleries. However, there are 35 additional MoMA curators in the departments of painting and sculpture, architecture and design, drawings, prints, photography, and MoMA PS1, who also organize the exhibition of moving image display at the museum. They do so in consultation with the film curators and the media curators, but they do so aggressively, and they do so in a friendly, comp comp in a, in a friendly competitive way. <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned before, a moving image has become a significant element of design and architecture. Uh, and the Department of Architecture and Design has taken a lead in exploring the uses of the moving image in social planning in the growing DIY movement. You can see there's a monitor on the, on the floor there, uh, more video projections. The Department of Architecture and Design are the curators at the museum who speak to us about open source and share economy and the maker culture, which is a, uh, having a major impact um, on the way media is being used and exhibited in museums. Um, and their exhibitions typically bring together artists, architects, designers, and moving image makers, and gamers. Um, as you may know, the museum has begun collecting video games in 2012. Very controversial decision. This is an installation of what the video games look like. I'm a little disappointed in this installation. It looks kind of not impressive. I wanted it to be more impressive. Um, and they're collecting the video narratives, the moving image. The companies that make the gamers won't give, sell you their code, the game codes. I mean, that's, you know, proprietary. But the museum curator talks about developing a relationship with the company, so in the future, that'll be part of the acquisition. Um, and some critics have complained the public can't play these games the way they can play them other places, so this is not an accurate description of video, of gaming. But from a design perspective, the narrative on screen of what's being exhibited here, um, I think the future of video, they're developing all these technologies so that wood and wall panelings and exterior buildings will have built-in exhibition capabilities so that you could you can feed the digital Im image right into the walls as part of the fabric. They put it, you can build it into wood through fiber optics 
and through beads. Um, that's probably the future that the A&D department will be dealing with more than, than the Department of Film. Now I want to return to a more white cube variation. This is the more standard. Uh, this is designed, um, again, monitors, standard television monitors. Um, She's showing Martha Rostler's semiotics of the kitchen. This was an exhibition at Cal Counterspace on mm -hmm. modern design for the kitchen. Um, these are MoMA collection shows, and the films to the left, the right there, are films from the film collection. I mean, and to the extreme right is the door. If I was, I would have rather had the curator to put the painting next to the door and the video next to the, on the other side, because it was hard to watch these when, in the exhibition because of where they were placed. Uh, this is a, an exhibition called Century of a Child by the same um, our A and D. So this is video installations by an architecture and design curator, not a film and media curator. Um, the museum-wide collection strategy is to build digital collections with a mind towards filling blanks. This is an A and D curator that you see um, Windsor McKay's Greater the Dinosaur. Um, here you see Lotte Reiniger's one of uh, Prince Ahmed. Um, here a child health documentary. Here again, moving images used by A&D curators, I find typically have a documentary function or they're intended to relate to elements of the design objects and flat artwork that's in the space. The curator's making connections between those things. It's also a way, you may have noticed this curator also puts the screens high. I wonder, as a curator, I walk through an exhibition at MoMA, and the first thing I look at is how the curators have hung the media. And I also watch the audience and see how many people stop and look at things. Can you look at a screen that's hung high in a ceiling over a doorway? What does the curator, how much time does the curator expect that someone's going to spend with that? Um, is it a way of just giving visual interest when you have a gallery with very high ceilings like this? You want to use the whole space? I must say, you can see that she's also put architecture and design objects high on the wall. Um, but for things to consider, uh, this image, the red cube right in the middle is a piece that I was involved in because this piece is a Hubbley work and the, the artwork to the left is some of the storyboards that went to create mm. the film. This was a children's section, it was a more uh, children's scale. Again, using a video monitor. And here the use of a monitor scaled to the other artworks on the wall. This is traditional way that media is shown in an exhibition. Um, The Department of Media and Performance Art. In 2006, the Department of Media and Performance Art was split from the Department of Film for a number of reasons I won't go into. They have to do with fundraising, uh, a wide variety of reasons. Stuart Kummer, as you all know, has come from the Tate Modern to head the department earlier this year. The installations I'm showing you, with one exception, all predate his time at the museum. This is uh, Ola Eliasson in 2001. Um, following two major expansions of the museum since the 80s, um, we're about to embark on a third installation. The, the museum has tried to put moving image and art in public spaces, most often moving image in public spaces. <laughs> when they started doing this, there was no budget for it, so Kyoto would propose putting something, and they would say, well, you have to find the money in your own budget, whatever budget you have to put the work there. Now they've budgeted for the space. Uh, this is an artist curated installation in 20, 2009, Joan Jonas. A work that was originally a performance work, reconstituted installation spe sp space, and Joan herself came in and curated the uh, installation of the work here. This reminds me of the William Kentridge exhibition because Kentridge also worked in the theater and they bring stage props in conjunction with the uh, moving image material. Uh, this is Arum Faraki. It was discussed at the first panel the other day, this installation at MoMA, um, called Images of War at a Distance in 2011. This was timed, as I said, to the acquisition of all Faraki's work. I mean, the museum purchased all his video work. And the museum, Department of Film had been collecting Faraki on film for many years before he began working in video. Um, so this became a kind of joint film and, film and, media, uh, and, and media acquisition. Um, the museum has encouraged us to do interdepartment acquisitions. The architecture and design department and the film department have been collecting film title sequences. How do you collect the film title sequence? Um, 
The A&E department collects the designer's art for the sequence. The Department of Film collects the moving image. If we have the feature film on the collection, if we're doing uh, James Bond, if we're doing Maurice Binder or something, we have the film on the collection. We also acquired the, that sequence in different formats. Um, it's been very aggressive in this. They're also trying to install MoMA exhibitions. So the painting and sculpture in film, it's, very, it's changing now. One of Stewart's mandates is to bring all the works of the museum's collection together in the space to break down these um, boundaries. Again, this is images of war. And of course, the way that the video was used by the architecture and design department is very different from the way that Faraka uses the documentary nature of the installation. The impression here of a library reading room, um, you see, was a direct response to the nature of the artist's work. Um, and it encourages as Faraki said himself, different ways for the, for, the, for the visitors to engage in the moving image, sit with it longer or, or spend less time with it. This is an installation of um, 2011 of Andy Warhol's screen tests, a uh, selection of 500 shorts he made between 64 and 66. The film department owns all the screen tests on film. Uh, there was a previous installation of this where the curator put large frames around the portraits and it was universally criticized as attempting to make the screen test look like art. Um, the Department of Film is an installation that I did with Ernie Gear in the mm. Titus lobby. This is the same lobby that you saw the cactus in. This is the lobby outside the theater. Uh, again, a black box, a quasi-black box. This is an exhibition of uh, Maya Deren and her legacy in um, 2010. Again, a kind of quasi-black box. This is an image of the same space in 2005 with the Pixar exhibition. This is a white cube installation with the video monitors. Again, this is the period in which I was trying to make my film cinema exhibition look like an exhibition in other curatorial departments. So that when I, uh, the public, I did this with Burton too intentionally, when the public went from Giacometti or Picasso into the Burton exhibition, there was this disjuncture wasn't as abrupt as might have been expected, and it was a way of addressing my concerns about how the other curators in the museum would react. Um, again, working with the, this is a public space escalators. Pixar created a moving image piece to project over the escalator. Um, this is a piece that looks relatively simple. Yap talked yesterday about doing something similar to this with um, uh, the, the uh, Fissinger films. I wanted to show. Pixar was a digital animation studio. They began making short films. These are the first six short films that they made. It, with each short that they made, they experimented with a new digital technology. So I wanted to put all these six films in crunch order, order side by side on the wall, but I wanted to turn the sound off. And when I proposed this to the people at Pixar, they were outraged. They said, no, this is abusing the work. These were made with sound. You have to show them with sound. We'll have to take this to John Lasseter, the head of the studio. Again, they did, and as usual, the artist said, he was fine with it. <laughs> the way it was worked was the f five on the left were silent. The one that went on the screen had sound, so they sequenced through. Visitors could sit there, and you notice this installation is very much a white cube installation. It looks, uh, and it was an intentional <coughs> choice. Um, kiosks for public access to moving image stuff. When you do a film exhibition, you think, well, a lot of the material is on DVD extras. I never show DVD extras in my exhibition. I'll go to the artist and say, I want, if you want to do something like this, you have to do new DVD extras for me, for the museum, and they would create new work. So the, they did new interviews with the artists. Um, also, this is 2005. This was a new building. Uh, they used the Pixar show to explore the way media could be used. This was the information desk, ticketing desk in the main lobby. I had the Pixar. They said, if you want to use these screens to me, you can use the Pixar. came in, and they animated the Pixar lamp. It was animated on these screens. It's hard to explain how it works. It's not a moving image. Um, <clears throat> Burton in, 2005, in 2009 noticed a very small, this is an iPad sized monitor on the wall. I love small screens. I like putting very small screens in a gallery space. I think the public likes it. They relate to an iPad screen. It wasn't something that they could touch. I showed his music videos and things, small, very high resolution, but small. Um, Tim's commercials, which hadn't been seen. Another example of that, in this, to the left, there's a small, I had heard that there were uh, stop motion screen tests for the Martians and Mars attacks, 
and you know, Tim wanted to do stop motion Martians and it was too expensive, so they ended, ended up doing another digital animated Martians. But there were stop motion tests that were done and it took me, it took us two years to go to McKinnon and Saunders to have ba the artist Barry Perps, I think that he made Barry Perps, perhaps? Yes. He made, yeah, yeah the stop motion. So, uh, he, uh, they recreated the, um, um, this was another piece. This was a lost Tim Burton film, his Hansel and Gretel film. Um, I must say that every, I didn't, when I did the t Pixar and Tim Burton had none of the feature films that people knew in the galleries. The first decision was we're going to show the feature films in the theater. I'm not showing any excerpts from the feature films. There were no excerpts from the feature films in Pixar or, or the um, Tim Burton show. The only moving image I show was moving image that people could not have seen in any other way, the commercials, the music videos. This was a thing that he had done for Halloween in 1988 that had only been shown once on Disney Channel. Disney didn't have any record of it. They kept saying it doesn't exist. Um, after many months, we found it. Um, we did, did the museum did a digital re re restoration. We have a restoration department. And the reason I showed it on a small monitor is because it was from an analog tape. The best visual quality we got was on a small monitor like this. There was art from the production art on the other side of the wall. So this is the black box leading right directly into a white space. It was very popular, with, as you can see, with children. Uh, when the show toured, a lot of the other venues wanted to project this image. I never liked it because it was very large, but it got blurrier and it wasn't a top it was good quality. Finally, um, PS1, and I'm going to go through, this is a PS1 curated exhibition, the Maria Ab Abramovich show, which many of you may have seen. In 2010, uh, this was a very, they had, this show had a lot of gallery space. The most highly budgeted kind of exhibition museum. This is a very grand scale MoMA retrospective exhibition, um, which featured a very large percent of moving image work displayed on a range of formats to sum up much of what we've seen so far. Well, there was also a nude performance. You can see the two nude, nude performers there in the corner. Um, the way moving image, again, high on the wall. There are cubes on pedestals. There are installation pieces recreated, as we've seen with Joan Jonas earlier. Um, so this is the way m museum m m media looks at the museum now. Here's a sculptural piece. Again, very audience-pleasing exhibition. Uh, and I'll make a, a few quick closing remarks, random closing remarks. Uh, how does installation underline and enhance the potential of the moving image? The choice of work, the format of presentation, and the context with other art. Also, it's timing in the history of the medium and in the history of the institution, and in the history of the city that the exhibition is mounted in, and the way it's mediated by the curators. So that's a lot, but I think good curators think about it. It's all part of what's, what comes into play. This is an example from the Mike Kelly exhibition in 2013 in New York. It's an example of how different an, art, an artist's work can be appear in an, exhibition, in an exhibition when it tours. This is in MoMA, New York. It was, this one piece was projected very large. I was in Los Angeles a few weeks ago and I took the snapshot of the exhibition, the same piece as it appears in Los Angeles. It's on a small monitor with two chairs in front of it. So the curators have made a very dramatic decision about how this, that particular piece should be exhibited in different spaces. This is an exhibition, this Patty Chang, David Kelly, and the piece to the left actually is the Emily Yassir's Ramal in New York. This is currently on exhibition at MoMA, and this is an installation that I, the one that Stuart was involved in, um, in the way that that area, gray area is presented there. Um, Stuart was very adamant. I did the Chang Kelly part of it. Stuart did the, uh, in his uh, curator, did the, did the Yassir Ramal in New York part of it. Um, and they wanted a very traditional, formal presentation following the artist. Again, this is an artist installation. The artist wasn't there, but they followed follow her guidelines. The bench was the guy that the bench the artist wore. This looks simple. This was, these mon the artist insisted that we use these monitors. These art monitors are no longer made. It took six months to find these monitors. We almost canceled this installation because we couldn't find the monitors. Our AV department found 25 of these monitors in Florida and the museum bought all 25 of them. <laughs> so in the future, this, we would have these monitors to do, exhibit the work. And if you acquire work for, for installation, you know this is an issue. Okay, what's wrong with this image? What's wrong with every image I've shown you of a, an exhibition installation up to this point? 
there's something seriously wrong with them. Now, this is what's wrong with them. <laughs> this audience. This is an audience in 19, uh, at the museum theater lobby in, I think it's 1940. This is one from the 1960s. This is one from, uh, this is a painting and sculpture installation in 2013. This is what the Pixar ex uh, Burton exhibition looked like. This is a selfie, for, uh, someone took this online. Museum doesn't take any images of their installations with audiences in them. They stage the installation shots. So there are a lot, these installation shots are a lie in a way. They're all heroic portraits. About the, yeah, this is the reality of what an, a, a gallery installation looks like. This is what a curate has to, be, has to think about when they install an exhibition. Um, and I just throw that out there. Um, I often joke to my, to my colleagues, the audience ruins my exhibitions. <laughs> the visitors ruin it. I come in, I've had this one of them, they've ruined it. You know, there's people standing in the wrong place. They're looking at their cell phones or they're, or they're taking photographs. Um, and I feel that way when I, go, I was at the Louvre. I felt these, um, my experience is ruined because people are standing in front of the paintings taking selfies. Um, <laughs> Uh, I also want to move on to, um, to the mechanical, the analog aspects to this. Um, I want to return to the 20th century world of moving image, analog moving image and the mechanics of moving image presentation. With a closing pl plea for preservation, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of to some degree or another, I just mentioned the Ramal in New York thing about the monitors. Um, Artists have sought to harness technology to creative ends since the beginning of the moving image industry, the moving image history. This will continue with every new technological medium and format. As new technologies replace the old, archives, galleries, museums, art institutions, distributors need to consider the preservation of the real world experience of the moving image work in its formats and technologies. I mean, this is Chris Marker's zapping zone, which Christine Vanache commissioned for the Pompidou. Um, Video and digital technology dates just as significantly as film does. Um, and the technology in, is essential to the, to the moving image. Um, as more museums give up on original formats, such as film and analog video, this experience of celluloid-based or mechanical cinema or analog video will become a more and more relevant way of engaging audiences in the museum context. Um, artists have not abandoned these mediums. This is uh, an exhibition in New York now in 2014, a performance by contemporary artists who are using the projectors to create light sculptures um, that in a sense reference home, uh, rec reference the Nickelodeon um, the artist's engagement with technology and the audience's engagement with the mechanics of performance has a future. And I wanted to show you a few examples of how, and other, how the museum has been trying to do that, use film. This is, a, 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 this is actually a media exhibition, you should know. Um, so the media curators want to work with film and the film curators want to work with media <laughs> in our department. And luckily we're all together and we, we appreciate that. So 16 millimeter projectors on loops. Um, this is a Runa Islam exhibition in 2011 where 35 millimeter projectors were, in the, were installed in the gallery with 35 millimeter projection. I must say, I thought that the technology overwhelmed the media, the moving image in this case, but I thought it was awesome to see this equipment in the this, in this space. This is from an exhibition um, called In and Out of Amsterdam in 2009. This is a painting and sculpture exhibition. Um, Andy Warhol, uh, Move Motion Pictures 2011. Here the curator has used Everything inside the gallery is in digital. He wanted to reference the original format. So the, it's a 16 millimeter film on a loop, actual projection. I noticed this Macba exhibition, uh, the Benoit exhibition, has, go over it. If you haven't checked it out, check it out yet. There are projectors in the gallery and they've done some kind of sculpture installation with a, six, with a, a Super 8 film, but it's not moving. The, it's not being, the projections are, are, are digital. Um, this is called, this is the, the images for the infinite film. This is the media curated exhibition that I just mentioned. Um, beautiful exhibition. I, the black and white exhibition design, to me, has a nostalgic quality. It harks back to the early installation shots that I showed you. But um, this one is spectacular. This is actually looped projection where the film was sculpting from projector to projector. Just amazing. Um, 
I'm trying to do my, my, my part in this. I have acquired this 1968, 60, 1960s French Scopatone machine. I don't know if you're all aware of Scopatone machines. They're a pre-video a uh, music jukebox where you put money in, press the button, and a 60 millimeter film, a music video played. This is what the inside of the machine looks like. Talk about a technological nightmare. There are 36 60 millimeter films that rewind and cycle themselves. This is a working machine at MoMA, um, and I'm trying to get into the gallery. The issues with this are very complex. What happens if it breaks down? It does break down. I have to find a way of making the breakdown of the equipment part of the exhibition experience. <laughs> I intend to do a live video feed from inside the machine, so when the machine mechanics function, you can see that on screen. I had a, 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 an artist, I had a technician come in and do a did a video of him showing how to replace the reel. I think I'll show, might show that in the, in the gallery. Um, and probably time, I want to show this. Digital people come to me and say, well, we'll just replace all the films in the machine with digital versions of them. I said, no. I, I want digital feedback. I want, there'll be digital, there'll be digital, the films will be in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the gallery digitally. But these films, these Scopatones are available online. Google Scopatone, you can see a lot of these films online. They were French-made films. There were thousands of them were made. They were even made for an Arab and an Indian audience into the 80s. Um, so that's an example of, of, of inviting, giving yourself a challenge. I talked about, this is an example of what I talked about where the painting and sculpture department, the film department, trying to find a way to bring their artwork together. So a, a 20s film about, about um, it's an abstract film, forget the title of it, next to some art on the wall. This is what that interface looks like today between the painting and sculpture department and the film department. And finally, a piece that, um, actually, I would like to see this piece that I'll show you in Times Square. I'm going to talk to Sherry about this. What you're looking at now is a children's toy from 1905. On paper, the strips are about this long and this wide, and they were intended to be animated. It was a form of home entertainment, moving image. This is film had already been invented. So these were collected in the collection of Ernie Gear, the, the filmmaker, and he had done the panoramas, the moving image. He's a collector of early film material. I, we decided to make this a project where we tried to bridge cinema history and digital technology. So Ernie spent five years doing, working on an installation of these where he's animated these for six screens. This was a test that we staged about a month ago where Ernie came in. The largest screen there with the red on it, that's Little Red Riding Hood. He liked that screen size. The media people came in and decided how the walls would be done. He wants it to be black box, it would be black floor. Um, and we acquired, we commissioned and acquired this piece. Also, I acquired the, uh, those, the artwork on paper. I wanted that to be part of the ex installation. Um, I want to end by just citing a point that was made in a discussion in Oprah House several years ago, that the moving, and this has been made by other people this week, the moving image exists with or without an auditorium or a gallery. And the people that work in that form, don't work in that form, are the other part of the equation of the way moving image exists in the world today. And we can take inspiration from that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience with all those images. Well, it's been great. Thank you very much for the amazing presentation. I'm so jealous about many of the projects you've been involved with. Fantastic. And uh, well, since our uh, panel, uh, all, all these loop uh, conferences are uh, about the audiences, what aspects of your work you think uh, they're important to attract new audiences? We were yesterday briefly talking about, do you know your audience? Do you can you, I mean, I know it's a, it's a very yeah, I, wide uh, question, but of course we all know more or less our audiences and what mechanisms between the artist and the, and the audience you use she's to... She's getting back at me because I went to the metamorphosis and says, Which, who, what's your audience for this exhibition? <laughs> she was thrown a bit. Uh, <laughs> when the museum asked me to do Pixar and Tim Burton, there was a reason they did it. They wanted to attract a large audience, logically, Tim Burton. It's going, to, it's going to be huge. They wanted to engage an audience of families. They wanted to enlarge the audience. Um, and they also wanted to break down the bounds between um, the commercial cinema and film that was just in the, in the, in the, in the theatrical setting. So that's my audience. Um, 
when I stage some, any exhibition that I put downstairs in that smaller space that you saw, the tightest space, that's where the film audience goes to the movies. I mean, people don't go down there that often, so when I install something down there, no matter how great it is, I don't expect to have a large audience unless they're going to the movies because they're afraid to go downstairs. The space of the museum is intimidating for that reason. Um, the audiences for Tim Burton and Pixar were, there was an aggressive art critic audience that came um, to say MoMA is putting Tim Burton in a gallery at the museum. Um, the Pixar exhibition was very well reviewed by Roberta Smith. Front page, great reviews. The Tim Burton exhibition was panned. The critic came in and said Tim Burton didn't belong in a gallery, that his stuff was not art. Um, um, he proved wrong. Um, the Tim Burton exhibition was the most popular exhibition the museum ever did, and it toured around the world. So. The Quay Brothers exhibition, again, was, uh, was very well received um, by the audience. And the audiences that we had were, I mean, when you do Tim Burton, everybody comes. I mean, celebrities come. People said Mick Jagger's in the gallery downstairs. <laughs> People like that. But I mean, we had a large, popular fan base audience that came. I mean, I would like to bring the Comic-Con, the comic book audience, to the museum. I think that's a great audience to have in. And that's, I have a project in mind to do that, to bring the audience for the Comic-Con audience that was partly what the Tim Burton audience was into the museum space. Um, it's a bit of a challenge, but um, something I'm working on. Um, we've seen many examples ho on how to display. I mean, for commercial cinema, there's no doubt. I mean, uh, they discover, or we discover very early how to show a commercial film in a theater. More or less, the the, uh, the venue hasn't really changed over the years, and the fact of you could eat and drink and be more relaxed. But but all the rest of the of the moving image uh, forms have been uh, sheltered in museums and, and cinematics, and we've been like. Um, uh, trying new forms over the years to display this work, as we could see very fine examples in your in your presentations. Um, and you mentioned some very interesting things, as as important as the content is the actual architecture of the place. There are many many things about about it that that are important. But for instance, you mentioned something about Modern Monday. I mean, do you how uh, how much are you involved as a curator on also inventing new um, new ways, uh, n not just to display physically the work and the content, but also uh, to find the right time within the year you were talking about. You, you have to have in mind which city you are on, and and how much of that you decide in order to bring new audiences to, to it? In terms of audience system, there's a museum upstairs in the executive offices. They decide what balance of exhibitions in the museum overall, the curatorial departments, what that balance should be. So they'll make a decision that I don't control. And often I'll do a presentation for a film exhibition that they won't get, respond to because I can see they're looking for a, they have a sense of what they want their season to contain. Mm -hmm. um, but the audiences, what I learned when I toured the Tim Burton show and the Pixar show and not the Quay show was um, how much I liked the fact that the exhibition changed from venue to venue. Um, the issue of having homogenized audience, a global homogenized audience, as some critics have said that we have to fight against uh, there being a homogenization to the way exhibitions tour and such. So when uh, the variations, when the curators want in different places want to change the exhibition, I welcome that. And often it's, they're talking about their audience. In Australia, they, all, the, all the other venues that did Tim Burton put his movies in the gallery. I didn't do it at Puma. And they said to me, we need to, our audience wants that, expects that in this city. They want that. In, I never said no. Mm -hmm. um, my role as a curator when the show toured was to represent the artist. So if they proposed something to me as a curator, you know, we traveled with the exhibition that we was to say, decide, say yes, and then to say, I need to check with Tim Burton or I need to check with the Pixar. And then we would write to them because we were expected to represent the artists. But um, uh, as I said, the curators know instinctively what the audience is, their audience is. Um, a New Yorker, I knew, I know what a New York audience, I just realized in talking to you that I knew, somehow <laughs> I know what a New York audience is. I don't know what an audience in Barcelona is. 
It's probably different to New York yeah, audience. I, I, they are different. <laughs> I mean, seriously different. I don't. Um, mm. Yeah, you, because you were talking about audience pleaser. I mean, and of course, you know, out of I, I do run uh, regularly to very different events. One is an animation festival, and the other is a steady screening for very experimental films and art and essay films and whatever. And it's it happens every Thursday and every Sunday through the season, you know. And of course, they are they, they are two. For instance, I find that audiences react uh, very well to the event thing. So it's easier to bring together so many people into four days of festival rather than engage an audience through the year to go regularly. But at the same time, it's got a very rewarding part, the fact of yeah, that you've been over the years and over the season building up an audience that they are, they end up, they start maybe being um, spectators and they are, end up being filmmakers and they know there is a regularly one meeting point and, and so on. And um, as important as the content, we are always thinking on, on ways to engage new audiences because for instance, for eccentric, uh, because it's very demanding, or people can think it's very demanding intellectually, the kind of films we show. But, um, but of course, uh, instead of uh, programming something that, uh, that can be m more easy maybe to the audience, what we try to do is an extra work of uh, trying to, to, um, to arrive to the audience uh, with information about those films. We have an, an archive where they can ent enter uh, freely and it's comfortable to use and it's easy. So um, I don't know, you know, you said it, uh, you said it before. I mean, the, the curator should uh, set up uh, or defend the artist or what is, uh, uh, has to be shown, you know. But, but at the same time, we are all the time thinking about strategies to allow the new people to get into, younger people or people that maybe they think, oh, eccentric, this is too weird or this is too experimental. So, so every now and then, maybe once a year, we do like an event because we know events work. People, you, you, they go there regardless you, what you are showing, you know, because it's an event. So, so we open up a little bit more and uh, I don't know, and sometimes uh, small um, things change, make a great deal of change in the terms like this guy that invented the, the night shows, you know, in the 70s, no one had thought uh, about Las Sesiones Golfas, the night shows, you know, and all of a sudden they discovered that they could show films that they didn't have any relevance if you would show them in a theater during the day, they would have a, a relevance showing them at night. Um. Well, you know, we have, since 1939, the museum has shows films almost every day of the week. That's why there are so many curators in the department. We have three cinemas that run all the time showing films on, in a traditional block mm -hmm. box. Um, so that's that opportunity. The opportunity, of course, as many people have said, there's visitors who come, they're only there for an afternoon. They're not there when the films are shown in the evening. So you want to find a way, we always want to find a way to bring mm -hmm. that work into the, into the gallery. And we also do websites, there are web, our exhibition is a website. The Tim Burton website is still online. If you go to the museum, it's archived online. You can go to and see what it looked like, mm -hmm. where we have to negotiate with the artists in the studios to get rights to put their video mm. work on the screen, only so much of it. Um, and that lasts, that stays up forever as a permanent record. Mm -hmm. exhibition. But I mean, you expect to have fans come in, for t something that you expect to be skeptical people, critics who are gonna come in and be skeptical of it. And it can be nerve-wracking. When I did the Quay exhibition, the, the critics were walking into the gallery while I was installing the exhibition, taking notes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the, it was very strange. And the press office was keeping the, the critics away from me, but I was you know, putting the work on the wall, and the critics were coming around. So it's a very, um, in an effort to get the review, they wanted the critic to have time to write, I thought, for a review. Mm -hmm. They have to come in while the work is being installed. Mm -hmm. um, so the curators are aware of the critical response. It's another audience that you have to be aware, you, you think about. I also think about what the other curators in the museum are gonna think about the exhibition. Um, mm -hmm. um, shows like Burton are destination shows. People come from all around the world. People came from 
the Burton opening, you can imagine. Burton is on, in a class by himself. This is not a typical uh, uh, kind of exhibition to do. It was very um, kind of high profile. People flew in from all over the world. Mm -hmm. to get, you know, people got tattooed and getting their books signed. They would, Tim would draw on their arm and they would come back in the afternoon with it. They'd gone to a tattoo shop and had it tattooed. It was, wow. It was, it was intense. But um, I, w yeah, I always want to give, I always want to give the viewer something, particularly when you're doing something that hasn't been exhibited before. I had the privilege of doing the first person to do Pixar, the first person to do Tim Burton. That's a once in a lifetime experience. Mm -hmm. When you curate work that's already been exhibited many times before, the, the, your role is different. But these exhibitions that I did, even with Quay, again, I was the first person to go to be embedded in their archive with the artists and mm. pull stuff out and put it on the wall. So it's yeah, different. I saw things for the first time that I had seen before, like those early films, uh, films they made when they were like really young. And yeah, you, yeah. you had and the entire. It, <laughs> because we have a, a archive. Pres an archive that preserves films, I'm still working with the Quays. I'm preserving the movie, the work that they, we brought into the exhibition is now part of the museum's collection that's being preserved. And we're still going back onto film. As long as we can, we're going to go back and make film prints. There are a few places doing that. I is still doing that, too. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's um, still the best format for presentation so far. Yeah, and digital. Mm -hmm. We have the digital scans. That's been done for archival purposes. But, mm -hmm. um, so the commitment you make to the artists can be long-lasting. Mm -hmm. So uh, any, there any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you for a great talk. My name is Bob Drake. With the advent of um, private spaces and private galleries um, and collectors who collect video and have to show them in those private spaces and private galleries with limited space and limited technique, how do you as a curator of a major institution react to the fact that there are many shows of video being presented, either privately or access to the public, and that there are also many curators uh, who are curating shows in those spaces. Um, well, basically, I think it's great. I mean, what they're doing here in Loop, the things, the screenings in these bedrooms is remarkable. I mean, it's, it's the fact that curators from institutions go to these spaces to look at how these, that's how you discover new work. And that's how you, as, as the fair here is suggesting, that's what we're here for, to look at work and see how it's being exhibited in different ways and decide whether we want to bring that work of the artist into the space or in some cases recreate the space if the installation at a private gallery or in a private viewing space is, is in the curator's judgment, an important aspect to the way they want it to be perceived, then we, would, we could create that installation into, in the space or invite the artist to create the, you know, come to the museum and recreate the space um, at MoMA. I mean, it's not a competitive thing. Uh, MoMA has, uh, curators have gallery days. We have four gallery days a month where we don't have to go to work. We're expected to go around New York and go to galleries and, and, and tour exhibitions. Or to go to the movies. I'm a film person. I can go to the movies four days a month. I never do because I'm too busy. But um, So the museum encourages us to go out and experience other gallery things. That's... Otherwise, you're not a player. You're not part of the scene. I mean, you have to be part of the scene. Everyone wants to be part of the scene. And there's competition among curators at the museum, friendly competition, to be the first person to see the way an artist is doing some, in a, in some private space and then to be the one that gets to bring it in, to bring him into a modern Mondays or to bring him in into the, um, to the museum um, for installation. Any more questions? No one has any criticism? Come on, someone must be. Or even your own experience as, no. a, as galleries, how you, how you, uh, how you engage your, your audiences. Or I'm sure you, can, you have an experience on that from the private, from a private gallery. How many of you are uh, gallerists? I mean, you, no, you just need to get curators to see your work. I mean, that's how it's done. I mean, we were, at MoMA, we're encouraged to bring work into the collection. We're expected to bring work into the collection. We're expected, as a film curator, I usually to, to find films that are about to be lost and bring those into the collection. I've done some remarkable things. And sometimes, um, 
um, things of a very high political nature. I recently discovered that a very important uh, black poetry film from the 1970s called Right On was about to disappear because the negative was lost. The artist said, I don't know where the negative is, it's gone, and all the were with very bad digital copies. This was the last poets. They did a very radical poetry slam kind of film. It's a very important film. You should bring it here to show. Um, and the, uh, the filmmaker had a piece of paper, a lab bill, that said where the film had been in 1975. So we spent, I spent sometimes finding the lab. I found that the negative was in a lab that had been sold to a collector. The collector had moved it to a storage facility. He hadn't paid his bills. So the storage facility would not allow the negative to this lost film to be released. So I had to find a wealthy patron to give me the museum couldn't buy it, but I had, to, I had to find a wealthy patron to ransom the film, to buy the film from this collector so it could be brought out of the archive and then gift the film to the Department of Film, at which point I could find the money, preservation money, to preserve the film. So we got the 35 millimeter negative, we did digital, did a digital restoration and went back to film on it, and now it's in the film department museum's circulating film collection in, on Blu-ray and DVD and also it's a 35 millimeter film, and the Black Poets came together. Um, it's a, a remarkable film. So um, that can be an activist. There's an activist, when you work in an archive that has a preservation, there's an activist act, uh, aspect to it. The curators are expected to be activists in the way that they engage with artworks and galleries and the way they engage with artists. I mean, I've, there are a lot of artists painting and sculpting people who've made movies at some point in their life. They have them in their closets, they have them in their bedrooms under their bed. No one's asked them about these films. I always ask artists, did you, did you make films? Um, and I recently discovered 19 films made in 1979 at a club in the East Village that no one has seen in 30 years. And the artist was playing around with them and I said, I want these films for exhibition and I want them for the museum's collection. Um, so I mean, that's what makes being a curator, it can be a, a private eye. Almost. Yeah, it has yeah. It's the detective, the archaeological part of it is what's the most fun for me. So even if the exhibition never happens, all the research and effort that goes into it is very gratifying, and it becomes part of the institution. I don't know if you want to mean what I mean by that, but it becomes part of the institution history, even if the exhibition doesn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. it's a strange thing to say, but. Um, you can do things for the moving image art, for the visual artists. You can do something to benefit them and their legacy, even if it doesn't in, in, end up in being an, an, something that's exhibited now. Um, it has a future life. Um, that's why I made that pitch about preservation. I hope that everyone who's involved with a gallery or a is, thinks of the preservation aspect of it when they're selling the work of art, because if you really care about the artist and the artist's work, you should care about that and make sure that that's part of, make institutions buy the technology if it's special, be sure that they get it, as long with, along with the work itself. Mm, that makes sense. Um, and digital preservation is a major frontier now. How do archives with all this moving image preserve their moving image? Um, the museum has an elaborately developed, next year you should have one of the, um, Kate Lewis from MoMA come and talk about how we're doing digital preservation. The strategy, which is a geographical strategy of putting the digital works on servers in three different locations around the United States it's a, so that it's preserved in case of natural, natural disasters and such. Mm. Um, and the media department, the field department are working this in development with the Tate, actually in a consortium of other museums to see that this happens. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an aspect of exhibition and preservation that's linked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he's been there from the from the start at MoMA preservation and, yeah, and yeah. showing it's, it, and it, collecting it, at the same time. Some institutions, Cinema Tech France, um, the CNC, the British Film Institute, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the I Institute. There are mm -hmm. institutions that have archives connected to them, and those that don't. That has an impact on the exhibitions that they do. It has an impact on the exhibition policy. And if you're curating in an, in an institution that doesn't have a collection, then you're going to be coming to the institutions that do have collections collections to mm -hmm. access the material, and that's what it's... Yeah, which is our case at CCB, we don't have a collection. <laughs> Ron, I, I have a question. Since, you know, the MoMA is one of the most visited places in, in New York, and one of the most visited museums, beyond numbers, how do you measure the impact that a specific exhibition can have uh, towards publics, audiences, communities? 
Is, do, do, you, do, you, do you have strategies, I mean, beyond numbers, beyond counting numbers of yeah. people? Do, yeah. how, do, how do you measure the, the, uh, the impact? I don't do it. There's a communications department that tracks the visitorship. Um, like visitors count. They can do a count of how many people visited the... And they can actually, this, they can actually control what they release, the numbers they release. I mean, they make a count, and then they'll tell the press what the count is. But I'm telling you, the count that they tell the press is not necessarily the count that actually attends. And, and is that the, the only count that they do? Don't they, don't they do another kind of um, measurements for the, for the impact of the, of the exhibition, either like uh, online about the, the noise and the, yes, all that? Yes, they do. There's an online MoMA. There's an online presence at MoMA, very active when mm -hmm. the collections are online. Not much film, unfortunately, at this point, largely because of rights issues. You can't get the rights from the studios to put things online. But they, they, they you know, they, they have that. There's also a lot of blog posts. The curator, we have to do blogs. We're told to blog. If we do an exhibition, we have to do blogs. They want three or four blogs during the run of your exhibition. Um, and they expect that from us. And they track the feedback that comes from that. Um, mm. But they do counts. I mean, they do counts of the number. And they, they do counts over the whole. I mean, there's a, they have a view of, this, of the whole institution, not just the film part of it. Um, I just go to the galleries and see how many people are there, and mm -hmm. uh, but they do do count it, and that's how they give projections about whether the museum is doing well or not doing well. Every insti major institution does this. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a question. I was a little bit surprised when you said the visitors ruined the exhibition, <laughs> um, and my question is. How much do you concern when you plan the exhibition, um, the behavior of people there? I mean, I know that the MoMA is always very crowded, like I have problems of concentrating on a work when I'm there because it's just too much people. And also with the photography you said, with the cell phones, I mean, couldn't one like um, implement this kind of behavior techniques to look at work with a cell phone or, or something like, are you, are you interested with in, in that when you create um, the exhibition? Because I had the feeling that it's the main focus is on the works and to present the works in a proper way. But how much of your thoughts deal with the behavior of the spectator? Um, I was kind of half joking when I said they ruined the exhibition. But partly I'm feeling for you. I go to the museum and I, I, I watch your experience of the exhibition. I think this is not the experience that I, as a curator I wanted you to have of this exhibition because it's too crowded. The Tim Burton show was horrible. I mean, really, it was a nightmare because the space was too small. Um, there's almost no way to get around that. And the, uh, the audience didn't seem to care. Some of the audience just didn't care. I mean, they like it. But it, the whole shopping mall, the nature of being a mall, that's the kind of environment these exhibitions can create. And it, how you discourage that, I don't know how you do it. I mean. At the museum, they do members' hours, where they say if you buy a membership, you can come in and have a, less, a more private uh, experience with the exhibition. That's one way they try to do it. They try to stage. It's a, it's a way to make money, too. You know, If you want privilege access without a crowd, you pay a little extra to get that access. They'll come early. Um, um, so that's one way they, they develop it. I would love to have, I think there should be a lot of handheld devices with things, but that's always a matter of budget. If I'm budgeting for the exhibition, I don't have enough money to create a, an audio guide. That's a, that can be very expensive to do a good audio, audio guide. But I would ideally like to have sound on an audio guide so that you could, as many exhibitions have done, you could, at certain points, when music, I would like to associate music. I've done this before. I did a show called Jazz Score, where the audience could come through and hear the score on headphones at a certain point by pressing a number. So that's something we wanted to do. At Pixar, there was an audio tour, and the Pixar animators recorded uh, each something for each of the pieces of art on the wall that I'd selected, so the audience depressed it. But that also creates a problem, because everyone stands in front of the piece with an audio thing, and it gets jammed up. Um, it's, um, I'm very bothered by it, but limited by budget. If you have any idea how curators and institutions can make the experience better, I'm, all of us would be um, the first people to, to take it, but it's an issue. And I, when I said they spoil the exhibition, I'm thinking of you, really. They spoil it. This is not the way I wanted the visitors to see it.
Uh, it's the same issue right now, for instance, with the show with Bill Viola at Grand Palais in Paris. It's just impossible to see it. But certain institutions in Europe, they have time schedules, so you can book in advance. Do you have that practice? Yeah, they did time ticketing at MoMA. Is it efficient, you think, or it's like people get frustrated at the some point? The problem points? was, at MoMA, if you were a member of the museum, you could come into the exhibition anytime you wanted to. So they instituted time ticketing for Burton, and everyone who couldn't get a time ticket, they bought a membership instead. So they immediately became members, and they went and made the museum huge amounts of money, because the membership cost $75, <laughs> the ticket cost $20, but visitors from Japan, people, visitors came and said, I'll pay $75 so I don't have to wait in line. So the galleries were still crowded. So I think time ticketing works. It's a strategy in, in some degrees, but if you have certain exhibitions, it's <laughs> the public will find a way uh, around it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I mean, it's a... So at the end of the day, you get the money, the numbers... I didn't get the and money. Yeah, uh, yeah, the institution the and yeah. frustrated visitors. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it was. People came... If you, a museum membership is very inexpensive in New York. You become a museum member for $75. If you live in New York, $75 is very inexpensive. We show thousands of films and video every year. You could come back. So members came back to Tim Burton over and over again. They were in trouble by the fact that it was a crowd. They just came back another day. It was the visitors, foreign visitors, who were only in town for a few days that suffered. Um, suffer the most from that experience, because if you're a New Yorker, student tickets in, Mo in New York are very inexpensive. The museum is a bargain if you live in New York. Student memberships are $20 a year or $25, very, very inexpensive. Um, and there's a lot of educational activities. There were student tours where the galleries were open to student groups of all ages, for tours of Tim Burton. So there were groups of people who got un unobstructed tours of Tim Burton at certain hours of the day. Young children came in and sat before they, you know, they would do artists, the um, artist guides would sit down, they would do drawings, you know, based on this. You do a most exhibition. So there was um, many ways of experiencing it, a show like that. And all the museum shows, there were artist tours, children's tours of the Quave show, where children sat on the floor and were inspired by the um, dormitory and the various things mm -hmm. reacted to them. Um, yeah, we, we created also some educational uh, material for metamorphosis. Yeah, the, there was the a fear at that moment that people, children would be afraid. Believe it or not, I said, I'm going to do Tim Burton. They said, well, children won't be able to go to the Tim Burton show because his art is too frightening. And we said, children love his movies. The movies are everywhere. They have them on video at home. How can anything we put in the gallery be frightening? Well, we had a doll with pin nails in it. We had a bloody doll. It was a prop from one of his films. And when the show toured in Australia, they, uh, they wouldn't show the doll because they were afraid that the right-wing government would come in and attack the exhibition, and all the focus of the exhibition would be on this bloody doll. So the, when I was there, the curator was embarrassed by this in, in Australia. So when I was, he, would, he kept pushing the vitrine behind the pillar. It was very amusing. You know? His, I would drag it out, and he would push it back behind the pillar. I know when I left, he left town, he took it away altogether. But in France, of course, the, the bloody doll was right in front, so everyone could see it. But in Australia, <laughs> as I said, city to city by city, exhibitions have a different life. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, so, um, thank you. Thank you very much for your.